folks, so today we're doing the uh, second lecture on Simone de Beauvoir's Ethics of Ambiguity. Um, first of all, to review what we went over last time, um, the key concepts from last time were this notion of existential freedom, bad faith, and uh, the serious world, right? And this notion of seriousness is going to come up again. Um, Remember that existential freedom refers to uh, the idea that the self is the radical origin of our decisions and, and consequently our, our actions, um, and uh, we're sort of condemned on the basis of existential freedom to uh, have to make choices against the background of um, an ambiguous future, right? We have to cope with ambiguity when we try to engage in ethical behavior. Right. And bad faith is uh, precisely how we go about uh, avoiding the idea that we have to do that, right? It's, it refers to the network of strategies, beliefs that we rely on in order to avoid confronting our existential freedom, right? And um, Beauvoir goes into detail about how uh, this existential, or, or sorry, this uh, bad faith is, is founded on... Um, the childish world, right? I remember we said that the childish world um, is a serious one, right? When we talk about the serious world, um, it refers to the world that the child lives in, where um, the child's actions don't weigh on the world in any significant sense. Um, the meaning of the world that they inhabit and their behavior um, is, is sort of created outside of them the the meaning um of that they they sort of right the serious world is one where uh meaning and, and the uh values and and the um sort of ethical content of your actions um is created for you right um you don't you don't have to create it it's sort of done by a static system of rules outside of you and um we hinted at this last time that uh bad faith takes a variety of different forms um and Beauvoir runs through all these different figures of bad faith and uh the common thread between them is uh these figures of bad faith all have different ways uh different strategies of um trying to conceal the fact that they have uh existential freedom um and or <laughs> they uh forget or, or deliberately disavow the ways in which their freedom is supported by the freedom of others. All right. As we're going through these figures of bad faith, um, I want you especially to notice the way that... Uh, don't, don't think of these figures as just sort of like static kinds, right? Notice the way that they sort of transition into each other. Because that's very important, right? Beauvoir is telling a story here about how um, the tendency to be one of these things also leads to a tendency to um, become the others, right? They're all sort of connected, and there's a sort of developmental uh, story that she draws between them, right? So pay attention to the way that they transition. So first up, we have the figure of the subman. Um, the subman is distinguished by the fact that the subman doesn't want to be a person, right? The subman wants to be a thing. They want to be like a static type of object, right? They want to be a concrete thing. Um, specifically, insofar as that they don't want to set up their own projects, right? They want their projects to be set up for them. As Bavar puts it, um, the actions of the subman are never positive choices, they're only flights, right? <laughs> to the extent that they sort of um, realize their freedom, they realize their freedom in order to um, do things that allow them to escape their freedom, right? In a sort of paradoxical sense, right? The only types of choices that they make are those that prevent them from dealing with the ambiguities of life, right? So to say that they want to be a thing, 
really means that they, they just want to be a type of thing, right? They don't want to be a person. They want to be a type of person, right? And um, being a type makes things easier, right? Because you don't have to... Um, being a type of person predetermines your choices, right? Um, it tells you what you are, so you don't have to figure it out for yourself. Um, and it tells you what you ought to do. Um, so you don't have to cope with the ambiguities of choice, right? I mean, you see this pretty often in people who use, uh, like, astrology a little bit too much to, like, justify their behavior, right? They say things like, well, I just did because I'm a Sagittarius, right? Or one of the, uh, probably most common examples of this is when you get people saying things like, well, boys will be boys, right? Um, where that statement functions specifically uh, to excuse people's behavior, right? Because it just claims that, um, well, it's not that person's fault. They're a type of thing, right? <laughs> the subman relishes that, right? They want to be a type of thing. Um, and there's also the sort of no true Scotsman fallacy, as they put it, right? People often say, like, you know, if you're a real American, you do X, Y, Z. I mean, you can think of a billion different examples of uh, people sort of fleeing from their freedom by uh, conceiving them of themselves as a type, right? Uh, saying, well, um, it's not me. That's, that's just um, the kind of thing I am. Because, um, right, if you're a thing, then that means that there are just sort of predetermined criteria for figuring out if you're a good one, right? Um, it's a lot easier to sort of figure out whether or not you're, um, a good or bad version of that thing if you think of yourself as a thing, right? In the same way that, uh, you know, a child that doesn't completely understand, right, the concepts of right and wrong um, looks to adults. They look to uh, other people. They they look um, to others to figure out like, well, am I like, was that good or was that bad? Right. Um, the subman really wants to just sort of externalize the task of um, deciding what it means to be good, right. Uh, as Beauvoir puts it, the, the subman is led to take refuge in the ready-made values of the serious world. He will take shelter behind the label. Um, so you would think that this is this, the subman would just sort of be pathetic um, if they weren't also very dangerous, right? Because keep in mind, when we were in the last lecture, we talked about how Quite a lot of Beauvoir's thinking about the figures of bad faith are informed by, um, you know, uh, the Nazi occupation of Paris. Um, the subman has a tendency to side with tyranny, right? They're, they're likely, they're a figure who's likely to become a fascist in the right circumstances, right? Because the subman is easily manipulated by people. Um, all you have to do to get the subman to do whatever you want is is uh, just tell them that they're a thing, right? Um, give them something concrete to be, and then say, well, if you're a good one, um, then you do this, right? That's sort of the uh, fascist myth that that uh, they relied on is that you know, um, you know, a fascist is a good German, and this is what good Germans do. Right, so the subman is just very easily swept up into nationalism, fanaticism, um, or anything really that allows them to not themselves be a concrete actor, but to place themselves under the banner of a label that frees them from the burden of uh, existential responsibility. Or at least they think it does. So the subman has a tendency to become a serious man as well, right? And the serious man is related to the serious world, right? Um, you know, the subman tries to erase all evidence of their freedom, um, but they can never completely erase the fact that they are the ones who choose, 
right? That's the sort of tension there. Um, you know, the subman thinks that being a subman is going to, like, make their lives easier, but actually it makes it quite a lot more difficult to constantly renew the sort of um, disavowal of your freedom. Uh, the serious man, in contrast, doesn't seek to themselves become a thing, um, but they seek to sort of turn the world into um, into a thing, right? Into a static, unmoving, concrete, immutable thing, right? So um, they think that the rules and the values, customs, lifestyles, uh, so on and so forth that they um, endorse are concrete objects, right? Um, this is the person who has a kind of tendency to... Um, repeat over and over, well, you know, rules are rules, right? That kind of, um... But, uh, what they mean when they say rules are rules, um, is not, you know, uh, that that's just a tautology. I mean, of course rules are rules. What they mean when they say that, um, is that they need the rules to be real, right? Because what they need to do, um, in order to negate their existential freedom is insist, like, well, look, it's not my choice. I'm just following the rules, right? Um, it's not up to me. Uh, I- I'm I'm not the one who is doing this, really. Not in the full-blooded ethical sense. I- I'm just following the rules, right? And this sort of commitment to following the rules, um, as if they're just sort of these, like, concrete, uh, independent things, um... Well, that, that shields them from having to actually confront their freedom, right? Uh, because what they um, are trying to deny is the idea that even if those are the rules, right, um, they are the ones who choose to comply, right? Uh, because they, um, even though they try to sort of submerge themselves in the rules, um, they're never able to actually completely uh, erase their freedom. And uh, I have there the um, poster for the movie A Serious Man. If you've never seen that one, it's a really good movie. It's, it's made by the Coen brothers. You know, the ones who did Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And uh, Big Lebowski and all that. Um, where the, the serious man that they're talking about here is a direct reference to um, the ethics of ambiguity. Uh, they are sort of tracing out this figure. So one of the common things about the serious man is that they, they operate under this pretense of maturity, um, but are really actually quite childish, right? They are um, childish insofar as um, they are seeking to return to the childish world, the serious world, where the rules um, are just sort of object-like and, and given from without, Right? established independent of their own concerns, right? Um, and the way that they sort of ceaselessly renew the denial of their own freedom is insisting that um, these rules and these values are, are like objects and they have no responsibility over um, their endorsement or their behavior, right? Um, or the values that they set up and act upon. Right, they they say, look, these are these aren't my rules. Um, I, I I just follow them. Right, I'm not the one who set them up. They really exist. Right, and they have a stake in their existing that way. Right, they have a stake. The serious man has a stake um, in defending these rules as if they really exist. They need to really exist for the serious man, because if they're not real, if they're not concrete, if they're not, if they don't live in an objective world. Of values, then they have to confront their freedom, right? That if, if the world isn't completely objective, and if they aren't just straightforwardly being told what to do, um, then <laughs> they uh, have to acknowledge that they are the one who makes a choice sometimes, right? And that's why the t- serious man has a tendency to become a tyrant, right? Um, and will support the tyranny of anyone who defends these sort of uh, serious rules that they childishly cling to. Um, Right, they're they're more committed to uh, 
the order that comes with these rules than they are um, to uh, freedom. As Bavar puts it, um, the serious man is always going to be disappointed. Right? This is like the subman, you know, they think that they're taking the easy way out by denying their existential freedom. But being the serious man is exhausting, right? Because um, trying to harden the world into a thing um, is betrayed by, uh, as she puts it, the very movement of life, right? <laughs> like, I mean, the world denies um, the idea that it is static, right? In life itself is just inconsistent with the image of the world that the serious man clings to. So the serious man always hates new things. The serious man hates difference. Um, anything that's different from the sort of like concrete thing that they are setting up. Uh, they hate change. They hate change, right? Um, since all of these things interfere with this impossibly static world that they set up and rely upon. Um, I mean, the serious man hates existential freedom and is going to go to great lengths uh, to deny that it exists. So the disappointed serious man um, has a tendency to become the nihilist, right? The nihilist um, is the disappointed serious man in some way, right? Because for the nihilist, if human projects and values and customs, rules, etc., right, all these things established on the basis of our existential freedom, if they're not concrete things that have some sort of object-like existence outside of us, right? The, the, if there are things that... Um, if they aren't things that uh, have a sort of, like, objective existence, then they're nothing at all, says the nihilist, right? For the nihilist, if values aren't objective, then values aren't real. Um, said otherwise, if values are human ideas or human projects, then, well, I guess values just don't exist, right? Um, I mean, the, the nihilist is the kind of person who says things like, uh, you know, love isn't real, right? It's just a chemical reaction in your brain, right? <laughs> if, 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 um, if a scientist can't, like, establish uh, human emotion like love as a sort of, like, like concrete three-dimensional object right, then it doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is chemicals. Um, this love thing that you talk about, that's just a human idea. Um, or d similarly, a nihilist will say, like, well, look, if, if morality doesn't come from God, then morality doesn't exist, right? Morality can't just come from humans. If it doesn't, if it isn't set up for us by an omniscient God, um, then I guess it's not real. If it's, a, if it's just a human project, then it isn't real. That's sort of like the Dostoevsky line, right? Um, I mean, they have a tendency to say that, uh, in general, like, well, that's not real. It's just a social construction. Which is silly, right? Because um, the nihilist is still uh, under the impression that values need to be things, right? Like, values need to be option, uh, objects, just like the serious man, right? And what they express by saying that, um, well, look, if these values just come from humans, and then they aren't real, um, they're really expressing a disdain or a hatred for human existential freedom, right? They forget that, like, they are also human, um, right? The nihilist is, is childishly disappointed about the loss of the serious world in the same way that the serious man is, right? So if... Um, if they have to be the one that right you can see how they're they're also running away from their freedom by saying like well look if there's nothing objective for me to rely upon when it comes to the exercise of, of my freedom and my values and my projects if these things aren't already determined for me then I guess they aren't real at all um, which is really a sort of, um, you know, it, they forget that, uh, the fact that they're set up, the fact that they're human projects doesn't mean they're not real, just means that they're human projects, right? 
So, again, the Nihilus is not just a loser, right? They are dangerous, right? In a way that Beauvoir also sees, uh, right? In, in the sense that they have a tendency to side with tyranny, right? Because they don't see the value in human projects, right? They see freedom as, as useless and arbitrary. Um, and, and that's what makes them dangerous, right? They are... Um, the nihilist undermines the value of human freedom and have even a kind of scorn for it, right? Um, and as before I puts it, right, that uh, even in their scorn for humanity, um, it's still their scorn. Right, um, so the nihilists still can't erase themselves. Right, they still have to realize that um, even if they are the one that's pursuing um, the project of, of of negating human values, that's their project. Right, even they still have a project. They haven't erased um, themselves. Right, they still have to confront their freedom um, in doing that. So, in contrast to the nihilist, we get the figure of the adventurer, right? Um, where the nihilist can sort of become the adventurer, right? Because um, the, the nihilist is sort of, as the disappointed serious man who's confronting this idea that, um, you know, values aren't objective, uh, the nihilist is sort of disappointed by this. And, and um, the adventurer, by contrast, uh, at least finds this exciting, right? The adventurer um, is not afraid of their freedom, right? The adventurer is sort of willing to um, take up the ambiguity of the world. Like, at the very least, um, the adventurer understands the adventurer is no longer running away from their freedom, right? They understand that there's a kind of joy in freedom um, and are sort of willing to sort of throw themselves into the ambiguity, uh, of the world and um, set up their own projects and, and have adventures, right? Uh, the adventurer thinks, well, nothing matters, right? So it's all just one big adventure. Um, but that's also why, <laughs> that's also kind of why they suck, right? Um, I mean, like, the adventurer makes you miss the serious man um, because. Whereas the adventurer retains the problems of nihilism, they do realize the joy of existence, um, and they sort of, in that way, um, the adventurer makes choices that resemble free moral choice, right? Um, they are at least able to throw themselves into something, right? But their approach loves adventure more than they love humanity. Right, or they're more committed to adventure than they are to the good, right, or or the ethical. Um, the excitement of adventure is more important to them than uh, the human values that are supposed to orient our conduct, right? Um, so at least while the adventurer is not running away from freedom, they are lacking in appreciation for how their adventures are supported by um, the social world, right? They are um, they don't appreciate that um, their freedom is supported by the freedom of others, which also makes them very dangerous, right? Because the adventurer also has a tendency to side with tyranny, right? If the tyrant, if the tyrant is um, something, you know, if tyranny makes their adventure possible. Right, if it makes it possible for them to do something fun and exciting, and throw themselves into uh, another big adventure, then there's no reason not to support it. Right, if the tyrant provides adventures, that's what the ventures the adventurer is committed to. Um, and as before, I puts it right: the only person who deserves the name adventurer is someone who, through their adventures, seeks the liberation of others. And that's precisely what the adventurer doesn't care about. They just care about sort of adventure for its own sake. So here, at this point, when we're running through the figures, we run into the second cause of bad faith, which is not just um, 
running away from freedom, but it's the sort of uh, disavowal to, of the idea that um, your freedom is supported by others, right? Um, the freedom of others is not taken into consideration. Um, that is to say, they sort of misinterpret the meaning of freedom, right? Uh, before thinks that, um, right, because personal freedom is made possible by the freedom of others, right? Our freedom um, to do things uh, <laughs> is made possible because we live in a world um, where our, our freedom is supported by a world that isn't just ours. It's, it's the social world, right? Um, you know, if you want to drive to the bank, you need uh, roads, you need uh, traffic rules, you need, um, you know, uh, somebody who knows how to build cars unless you know how to build your own car, right? I mean, just the, the once you start looking at even one tiny concrete task, you sort of, um, it already explodes into uh, a plurality of um, others that support this thing that you're doing all the time, right? Um, so to really desire one's own freedom, as she puts it, is necessarily to desire the freedom of the other as well. Um, freedom has to desire freedom universally, or else it isn't real freedom, right? It's just domination. Uh, as she puts it, there's no my freedom and your freedom. Um, certainly if the two are sort of opposed to each other. Uh, freedom is something that we do together, right? Freedom is a team sport for Beauvoir. Um, and it's something that we make possible for one another. Uh, so this sort of lack of respect for the freedom of the other is also a condition for bad faith expressed by the adventurer and you're gonna see how this is also expressed by the uh, figures that follow because we run into the passionate man next where the passionate man unlike the adventurer um, the passionate man uh, dedicates themselves consistently um, reverently uh, to some goal or project or end right um, so, the passionate man is not just interested in the excitement of adventure. Um, their adventure is about something, right? Their adventure is about some goal. Which is why I included um, a picture of Captain Ahab from Moby Dick or uh, Wile E. Coyote are <laughs> both sort of examples of the passionate man, right? Because they're sort of uh, monolithically defined by a singular project right all ahab wants is the white whale and is willing to uh risk everything including the the lives and safety of others in order to get it right uh in the same way that um the only thing that defines wily e. coyote is chasing after roadrunner right if <laughs> you know um what's he gonna do if he catches roadrunner like the story's gonna be over his life isn't gonna have meaning anymore because he's sort of just monolithically defined it himself in terms of one thing, right? So they're, the passionate man, um, their whole identity gets wrapped up in this one goal and uh, the pursuit of that one goal. And um, usually once they get it, or once the project becomes impossible, um, they aren't even happy, right? <laughs> like they don't even actually want to achieve that goal. They just want to want it. Um, and the problem here is that for the passionate man, everything else in the world becomes significant or insignificant in light of that one thing that they have committed themselves to. And they're always willing to sacrifice too much to achieve that end. Um, and this too often comes at the expense of the freedom of others, right? Which is precisely why the passionate man has a tendency to become a tyrant, or to become a fascist, or to ally with fascists, right? Because um, they they don't care about ethics, really, um, or they care more about that one thing. And they will ally with anyone who allows them to pursue their passionate goal, right? Um, because the ethics and, and freedom, um, the ethics surrounding the freedoms of others doesn't really matter for them. Because as far as 
other people are concerned for the passion, man, you're either just with them or against them. Because it all has to do with that one thing that they are passionate about. Which brings us into uh, the critic and the artist, which are um, related in some ways, right? Uh, the critic, unlike the passionate person, the critic uh, doesn't really attach themselves to any particular end, right? Um, for them, everything is just options, right? Um, they, they can appraise the advantages and disadvantages of every possible option, right? And for them, freedom is just about choosing um, among all of these pre-given options that are just sort of out there, right? And they see the flaws with all these options anyway, right? <laughs> They're just sort of, um, you know, the the critic believes that they have this sort of pure view from nowhere. They believe in the pure independence of the mind, right? Like, the critic thinks that they are actually a sort of, like, disinterested subject um, that is able to, from one perspective, criticize uh, every possible position. Um, and, as Beauvoir puts it, you know, nothing escapes criticism except for themselves. Um... But the critic creates nothing um, and only administers choices, right, within a field of pre-established options. So that is to say, uh, the critic is a lousy guy because he just sees everything as meaningless options and, you know, nothing is really, uh, on some level, any better than any other option. So um, you can't do ethics from that position. And the artist, um, well, they, the artist sort of, um, as she puts it, attempts to realize existence as an absolute in a different way, right? For the option, for the artist, um, it isn't just about options, right? The artist tries to sort of pin down or make it eternal some expression of the meaning of being, right? Um, which is to say they sort of seek to represent the world or express the world as an absolute object, right? Um, which causes the artist also to sort of think of themselves as the absolute as well, right? Um, the sort of, you know, this is the kind of, like, artist that is able to... You know, the, they express the sort of existential creativity that is required for um, genuine ethical um, behavior, right? But um, for the artist, it's still, it's not about the freedom of others, right? It's about themselves, right? Um, art is this sort of finality without end, as she puts it. I'm actually not exactly sure what that means. If anybody has any insight into that, let me know. But, I mean, the, the problem with the artist is just that um, they are able to sort of creatively throw themselves into the world in a way that's sort of necessary for genuine ethical action. But um, at the same time, they sort of, uh, I don't know, they sort of do it for themselves, right? And all of this comes to an end... Um, where Beauvoir thinks that what we have to try to take up is some sort of existential seriousness, right? Um, so we've come back to this notion of seriousness, right? But for her, it's not a seriousness that comes from a sort of pre-given static world of values that were um, sort of stuck in like the child is stuck in, right? But, um, the existentialist is supposed to, um, acknowledge two central tenets, namely, uh, the idea that ethics is impossible unless we acknowledge our existential freedom, right? Um, ethics is only possible on the condition that we realize that when we are acting, we are the ones who act, right? Our radical freedom is at stake in everything we do. And we don't get to pass the buck when it comes to personal responsibility, 
right? We have to take radical responsibility for our radical freedom. So we should never act, one ought never act in such a way that disavows our responsibility for the choices we make. That is uh, sort of tenant number one. Um, and the second thing that one ought to take seriously is the idea that personal freedom um, has to, at the same time, desire the freedom of others. Right? Because freedom is a team sport, right? Personal freedom is supported by the freedom of others. So a freedom that comes at the expense of an other is not genuine freedom, right? It's simply domination. And that, for Beauvoir, is not actual freedom. Um, cool. So those are the figures of bad faith. Uh, I mean, this is an attempt to try to, you know, she's not giving an absolute taxonomy of all the different figures of bad faith. I mean, there there are um, there are both more and less. Uh, you know, this doesn't account for the total field of um, everything, and she doesn't think it does. But she's sort of uh, trying to give you a story where, again, it's not just about these figures as discrete entities. You're supposed to see how all these seemingly disparate figures. Um, share these common commitments uh, are either running away from their freedom or are not committed to the freedom of others in the exercise of their personal freedom and uh, that's what makes them unethical right that that that's what puts them in a position that makes it impossible to do ethics from the world position of the world that they've set up for themselves right um, and worse than that it sort of uh, sets them up in a way that um, gives them a tendency to side with tyranny. Not automatically, but in the right sorts of circumstances. The problem with all these figures um, is not just that they're pathetic. So that they tend to be fascists. <laughs>